This video is sponsored by TrueFire. Over 2 million guitar players worldwide improve their playing using TrueFire's online lesson systems. Learn, practice, and play with TrueFire. Hi, this is Keith Williams. Welcome to 5 Watt World, where we're interested in helping you get the most music from the least gear. It's the spring of 1980. I've just finished my second year of college, and for my co-op job, I've convinced the owner of a local bar to let me help him computerize his bookkeeping. He tells me that he thinks that'd be great, but what he really needs is another bartender on band nights. I feign reluctance, waiting painful seconds before accepting. What he doesn't know is that the scheme all along was to gain access to the bar on those band nights each week. It's a beer bar, trays of kamikaze and flaming jelly bean shots going out in waves, and I learn the ropes quickly. Popcorn on the floor, smoke coming out of the bathrooms, a general aroma of stale beer. You know the place. Fridays and Saturdays were a revolving door of whomever was coming through town, but Thursdays there was a house band. Two guitars, bass, drums, and lead vocals. In the six months I was there, I learned their set list and their drink orders better than I knew the streets in my hometown. Rhythm and lead vocals were by the three Colorado brothers, together who owned the local body shop, and they could hold their own on their instruments. But the lead guitar player? He was the real deal. And man, for a guy playing in a local bar band, he went through the guitars. One week he'd come in with a custom-built BC Rich Mockingbird, or an old Strat the next. And then, one week, he showed up with a Bicentennial Reverse Firebird. As they launched into Devo's Canary in a Coal Mine, I remember thinking all at once, what the hell is that guitar? And man, it sounds good. That was my first glimpse of a Firebird, and until making this video, I never knew the real backstory. So if you've always wondered about the story yourself, stay tuned, because this is the 5 Watt World short history of the Gibson Firebird. If you enjoy our videos, take a minute to subscribe and hit the bell icon to be notified when we put out new videos. And if you've already subscribed, swing by the store and grab a t-shirt or a mug to support what we're doing here. If you don't need another t-shirt, consider becoming a friend of 5 Watt. The links are in the description. The dawn of the 1960s saw big changes at Gibson. They had just begun work on a $400,000 expansion of the factory on Parsons Street in Kalamazoo, Michigan. Completed, the 120,000 square foot factory stretched for two city blocks. That year saw a redesign of the Les Paul lineup. The Junior, Standard, and Custom all got changes, applying a modern sculpted design. Gibson had been losing ground to Fender in the solid body guitar market, and so another attempt to slow down Fender's growing dominance in the marketplace was made at the same time. Ted McCarty later told guitar historian Tony Bacon, We wanted another deal, something that our friend Fender couldn't make. So in 1963, Gibson introduced an entirely new line of solid body electrics, the Firebirds, with a significant nod to the earlier failed Explorer. Breaking from the process that they used for the earlier modern guitars, Gibson hired an outside designer, legendary car designer Ray Dietrich. Dietrich had started industrial designing in 1910, right around the time cars were invented. He pioneered the idea of a custom coach builder, designing the entire design on paper before building started. Over the decades, he worked for a large number of companies, always running his own design firm, doing jobs for Lincoln, Packard, Duesenberg, and Ford. After working with Checker Cab in the twilight of his automotive career, by 1960, he'd retired to Kalamazoo. Ted McCarty met Dietrich at a talk he was giving on his years designing in the auto industry. After the talk, McCarty approached him and asked if he'd be interested in designing a guitar. Dietrich agreed and came up with the new fantastic-looking design line of electrics that would ultimately go on to be produced as the Firebirds. Often in design, getting a good name for a product is one of the most difficult challenges. It has to be unique and has to work well in several markets and potentially in several languages. Designers often find themselves in near existential dread, grasping at ideas. And that's just where we find Gibson's brain trust, sitting in McCarty's office one day, brainstorming. But then, according to McCarty, Ray said something to the effect of, why don't you call it the Phoenix? And McCarty recalled saying, isn't that the Firebird, the old story about rising from the ashes? The Firebird first appeared in the June 1963 catalog. Gibson announced the guitar with the words, This revolutionary new series of solid body guitars, exciting in concept, exciting to play. You'll find a whole new world of sound and performance potential. Plus, that sharpness in the treble and deep, biting bass. <laughs> there were four models, none too creatively named the 1, 3, 5, and 7, each with a different configuration, but following the same overall design and build. 
If you quickly notice that there are two missing numbers, the 2 and 4, those were assigned to the matching base models, the Thunderbirds. But there never was a model named 6. The line was announced just before the NAMM show in Chicago, July 21st to July 25th at the Palmer House Hotel. They were in the July price list, and by October, production had started. The Firebird was the first Gibson solid-body electric guitar to use a neck-through construction. All previous Gibson guitars had glued-in set necks, and the Fenders were, of course, bolt-on designs. Rickenbacker was the only other commercial builder using a neck-through design at the time, most notably seen on their 4001 bases that had launched in 1961. This neck style would gain popularity again around 1980, along with a deep belief in brass hardware in all forms. But in 1963, this was a new thing. So a central section of laminated mahogany and walnut ran the entire length of the guitar, from the headstock to the lower strap button, such that the center of the guitar was all one single unit. Two slightly thinner mahogany wings were glued to this center block to complete the body shape. Interestingly, Gibson left the center section with the pickups and bridge slightly higher than the rest of the body. The back of the guitar had what you'd call on a Fender guitar a tummy cut, a gentle contour along the top making the guitar rest more comfortably against the body. The body itself was something like a curved off explorer, asymmetrical and aggressive all at once. The shape had a lower horn that appeared to be thrusting more forward due to the upper horn being rounded back. It was this shape that would lead collectors to later describe these as the reverse body, as the horns were mirrored from what you'd see on earlier dis asymmetrical designs like the Stratocaster or Jazzmaster. There was a large white pickguard below the pickups, which would later sport a Firebird emblem, also designed by Dietrich. These logos were largely missing from the earliest guitars produced in those last few months of 1963 and are a way to recognize the earliest models. There were 22 frets on a rosewood fingerboard on the 1, 3, and 5, and an ebony board on the 7. There was also a raised section on the headstock, mimicking the raised section of the body. The truss rod was adjusted to the headstock and was covered by a large plastic cover. The 1 and 3 got perloid dot markers, and the 5 had the perloid crowns of the Les Paul standards, and the 7 had the block inlays of the custom guitars. There was a white plastic nut, and the scale length was the Gibson Typical 24 and 3 quarters. The controls were the standard volume and tone, one each for the single pickup model, and two each for the two pickup model along with a three-way selector switch. Under those controls were 500k pots and 22 microfarad capacitors for the tone controls. The three pickup 7s selector was a three-way that worked the same way as those found on SG Customs, neck pickup, middle and bridge pickup, and bridge pickup. The output jack was on the face below the controls. The knobs were the then standard silver caps, marked either volume or tone accordingly. Of course, all of this controlled the newly designed Firebird pickups mounted to the raised center section of the guitar. Not to be confused with many humbucking pickups, the Firebird pickup has a completely different type of construction. Many humbucking pickups use a single bar magnet that sits below and between the coils. The magnet touches each of these posts and creates an opposite magnetic field, creating the humbucking. Conversely, the Firebird pickup uses two rail-style magnets, one each in the center of the bobbin, around which the coils are wound. There are no steel posts, the rail magnets picking up the string vibrations. This results in a completely different magnetic field than a mini humbucker. Because fewer winds can be put around the rails, there's also lower output, yielding a brighter tone. This lower output also accounts for the reputation as being quieter than mini humbucking pickups. These original versions, in addition, were not wax potted, and hence can become quite microphonic. The perfect example being the Firebird pickup in the bridge of Neil Young's Les Paul, Old Black. The pickup was famously added to Young's guitar when the original P90 failed while they were on the road, and the only pickup they could find locally that would fit was a Firebird pickup. Young liked it so much, it was never swapped back out. My buddy Rhett Schull is making full use of the Firebird into a Tweed Deluxe in the intro and outro of the video. See his video on the tweed sound for even more examples. The Firebird 1 was the only guitar in the line not fitted with a vibrato as standard and instead came with a wraparound tailpiece. The 3 had a stud style bridge and simple maestro vibrola, where the 5 and 7 came with the deluxe with a tubular arm and decorated cover. All the models launched with nickel plated hardware save the 7 which came with the custom style gold plating. The standard finish was a brown to black sunburst, but Dietrich encouraged Gibson to follow out Fender's direction by using custom car colors for the first time. Prior to this, Gibson had only offered their electric guitars in standard colors, usually sunburst, cherry, or natural. 
It was Gretsch that had really started the custom color thing way back in 1954 with their Cadillac Green and Jaguar Tan. Fender had done a few custom colors in the early 50s, but it really got serious in about 1956 when they started using the DuPont Duco color charts for a limited number of guitars. Fender formally introduced their color chart in 1961, where Gibson would release their color chart with the Firebirds in 1963. The advertising read, There are 10 beautiful Gibson custom colors, one that suits you and your personality perfectly. The color chart listed metallic finishes with the name Poly. The color names were Cardinal Red, Ember Red, Frost Blue, Gold Mist Poly, Heather Poly, Inverness Green Poly, Cary Green, Pelham Blue Poly, Polaris White, and Silver Mist Poly. It didn't take long for people to point out that the Gibson colors were really rather close to Fender colors. For example, Gibson's Cardinal Red is very similar to Fender's Dakota Red, or Golden Mist Poly is nearly the same as Shoreline Gold Metallic. In the end, it worked out that Pelham Blue and Cardinal Red were the most requested custom Firebird finishes after the most popular Sunburst. Ordering one of the custom colors was just a $15 upcharge, and the timing was right that just a lot of custom colors Firebirds went out. The July 1963 price list showed the new guitars as follows. The one was listed for $189.50. The three was $249.50. The five was $325. And the seven was $445. The optional case was $46. The new Firebird 7 came in as Gibson's most expensive solid body that year, as the Gibson Les Paul Custom, SG, was listed for $425 on the same sheet. Thankfully, it didn't take long for Firebirds to sell better than the Explorers had. Though, given the abysmal failure of the Explorers, that isn't saying much, really. The Firebird 3, with two pickups and a bound dot neck, was the most popular. But by the beginning of 65, the factory managers had started making noise about problems with building the guitars. Firebirds were a difficult and expensive guitars to build, and there were rumblings that with a design by a car guy instead of an instrument designer, this should have been anticipated. Over the years, there have been rumors that Fender had threatened to sue Gibson over the similarities of the Firebird to their offset waist Jazzmaster and Jaguar designs, and that this is what led to canceling the original style. Whether they threatened to sue or not is debatable, and likely lost to history, but Fender was certainly displeased. They went so far as to run an ad that showed the Jazzmaster and Jaguar guitars with the headline, The Most Imitated Guitars in the World. But guitar historian Tony Bacon thinks the lawsuit explanation is unlikely. Fender only had the 1959 design patents for the offsets on which to base a lawsuit. Even if it happened, blaming Fender was more likely a convenient way to cover Gibson management's lack of vetting the guitar completely with the actual guitar builders in the factory, only to discover that they couldn't build and sell the new model profitably. So they realized something had to change, and they began to look ahead to the next version. While doing this, there were a number of transitional guitars that went out. These include reverse body guitars, but with the new headstock, which is swooping down, more like a Fender-style headstock. The guitars also began to be shipped occasionally with P90 pickups, and this continued until the fully realized models were released in 65-66. The sum of answers to all of these questions came in the late 1965 non-reverse Firebird. The new body style was almost flipped compared to the original. The neck through was replaced with a traditional glued-in neck, and the raised center section of the body disappeared along with the neck through and the headstock became more Fender-like, wearing lighter and less expensive standard tuners. The June 1965 price list showed the new Firebirds for the first time, and each of the new models was less expensive than before the change, even though they were released years later. The one was now $189.50, the same price it had been back in 1963. The three was $239.50, the five was $289.50, and the seven was $379.50 down from a $500 price for the reverse version of the 7 the year before. Gibson also built some 12-string Firebird 5s starting in 1966. But what about those two missing numbers, the 2 and the 4, the Thunderbird basses? Introduced in 63 along with the guitars, they shared much of the design and construction details of the guitar's neck through construction. Like the guitars, these basses had their sights directed on the Fender basses of the time. And unlike other Gibson basses with a scale length of 30 and 1 half inches, the Thunderbirds were full 34 inches. There were two models, the two with one pickup, and the four with two soap bar bass pickups. In 1966, the basses transitioned along with the guitars to the non-reverse style. Non-reverse Thunderbirds were produced until 1969. 
Though fewer non-reverse Thunderbirds were built, the earlier reverse-style body instruments remained more valuable. Overall, the marketplace was unimpressed with the new designs, and neither style changes nor price cuts drew more buyers, and by the end of 1969, the Firebird lineup was dropped. Brian Jones and Keith Richards each bought a Sunburst Firebird 7. They appeared on the TV show Hullabaloo, playing both the guitars. Jones went on to buy a non-reverse Firebird 7 as well, which he played occasionally in the period before his death. Interestingly, it was around the same time that demand for the original pointy guitars, the Moderns, began to increase. Lonnie Mack and Albert King were playing Vs, and by 1975, Billy Gibbons was sporting a flying V as well, playing it all over the Fandango album. By 66, Ted McCarty had left Gibson and had acquired the Bigsby Company, moving it from California out to Kalamazoo. In 1968, Stan Rendell was appointed president of Gibson, and he brought Bruce Bolin on to help revitalize the brand's image. Bolin felt the world was ready for some modern guitars again, and he set about planning what would become the Medallion Series guitars. The first guitar in that series was the Flying V in 1971. But in 72, there was a reissue of the original Reverse Firebird 5 style guitar. Both of these guitars carried a limited edition medallion inset in the body. Like the V in 71, they built approximately 350 Firebird 5 reissues in this limited run. During this time, Firebirds were easier to find than Explorers or Vs. Eric Clapton had bought a Reverse Firebird 1 in Philadelphia in April of 1968 and used it during Cream's farewell concerts that year. Texas bluesman Clarence Gatemouth Brown played a modified non-reverse Firebird 5 for many years, and a growing blues audience at that time put him in the public eye with that guitar. But one name carries the Firebird banner like no other, Johnny Winter. Raised in Texas, the blues man signed to Columbia Records in 1969 at a young age. Many became aware of the singing slide tone possibilities from a Firebird from Winter's playing. He said that he played a number of guitars prior to his first Firebird, including Fender's and an SG. He bought his first Firebird from dealer Ed Selig in St. Louis. Winter said, Before I got mine from Ed, I'd never played one. It was either in 70 or 71 when I bought it for $225 cash. Winter went on to own a number of Firebirds, but that first one is the most famous and was his favorite. A Sunburst 1963 Firebird 5, on which Winter replaced the original Vibrola with a standard tailpiece. Of that favorite guitar, Winter said, the neck is nice and thin, which I like, and it's not particularly heavy like a Les Paul. There's nothing it can't do. Bluesman Howlin' Wolf played a 63 or 64 Reverse 5. Phil Manzanera joined Roxy Music in 1972. The band took one look at his 335 and told him to get a Strat. And he did as he was told, playing that Strat that he'd bought from fellow bandmate Brian Eno, along with his 335 on the first album. On the lookout for something that fit in with the band's image and his ideas of what rock and roll should look like, he kept his eyes open for a different guitar. He answered a newspaper ad saying that someone was selling a guitar because they were moving, and when he got to the house in a posh part of London, the teenager that met him at the door was holding a bright red Firebird. For 160 quid, he bought it on the spot. It was a 1964 Reverse Firebird 7 in Cardinal Red. Manzanera said, it looked like the fins of the back of a Chevy or a Thunderbird, so it had to have American car colors. It had the look all right, and it appears on the inner sleeve of the band's second album, For Your Pleasure. But with the added fun of the layout artist having reversed the photo, so that Manzanera appears to be left-handed. In 2008, Manzanera released a solo album on which he only plays that guitar. The album is titled, appropriately enough, Firebird 7. Stephen Stills was an early vintage guitar collector and was often seen with a reverse Firebird 1 on stage. After the Beatles broke up, Paul McCartney often played a right-handed Firebird. The guitar solo on the 1970 s hit Maybe I'm Amazed was played on that guitar, the searing tone of the Firebird playing against McCartney's raspy shouting. As the 1970s ran on, vintage guitars were increasingly becoming a thing. Norman Harris opened Norman's Rare Guitars in California, and George Gruen began writing articles for Guitar Player magazine on guitar collecting. Tom Wheeler published The Guitar Book in 1974, and Andre Duchessoir's Gibson Electrics was published in 1981. As prices began to climb, price lists from Gruen's during the 70s showed reverse Firebird 3s for about $500, and a slightly rarer 5 or 7 would go for a little more. The non-reverse guitars were less desirable, usually going for 400 or less at the time. Ex-traffic guitarist Dave Mason switched from a Strat to a reverse Firebird 5 in the mid-70s. 
Steve Jones of the Sex Pistols had a taste for fine Gibsons, and along with Les Paul Special and Gibson Customs, used a Firebird and an SG Standard along the way. Steve Clark of Def Leppard played multiple reverse Firebirds. And famously, Sonny Landreth has said that his favorite guitar is the Firebird, but they're just not practical on the road. Big case, fragile headstock. You can see him playing a Firebird backing John Hyatt in 1987 on this German TV performance. Meanwhile, the new Gibson plant outside of Nashville opened in 1975. The new plant emphasized machine production of fewer models, so the solid body guitars were the obvious choice to be moved there from Kalamazoo. 1975 saw them release a late 60s style Flying V, and in 1976 they launched a new version Explorer that lasted in the lineup into the early 80s. It sported a red, white, and blue Firebird logo on the pickguard, appropriate to the occasion, an unbowed fingerboard, like an old Firebird 3's, a stop tailpiece instead of the original Vibrola, and gold-plated hardware. Along with the Bicentennial Firebirds, Gibson reissued a Thunderbird 4 bass. It featured the reverse body and neck through construction. Like the guitar, it also sported the red, white, and blue logo. The 76 edition Thunderbird was produced in tobacco sunburst, ebony, white, or natural finish, and was in regular production until 1979, when it again was discontinued. Gibson would begin producing Thunderbirds again in 1987, and has been in regular production with a number of variants in the Gibson, Gibson Custom, and Epiphone line until the present day. Notable models are the five-string Epiphone 4 and the 2012 non-reverse Thunderbird run in Pelham Blue or Vintage Sunburst Nitrocellulose finish. Thunderbirds were played by the Who's John Entwistle from 1971 to 1974. Tom Peterson with Cheap Trick used his 1964 Thunderbird. Kim Gordon of Sonic Youth played a 76 reissue, and Adam Clayton of U2 used two vintage Thunderbird 2 basses on tour. Then for years, there were no new Firebirds until the early 90s, and then again in the early 2000s, there were reissue runs of the reverse Firebirds, and a 1, 3, 5, and 7 being built. There have also been Epiphone versions of the Firebirds released over the years. Gibson's got on the Relic bandwagon in the 90s and put out a worn mahogany finish on one of their Epiphone worn Firebird studio models. In one of the most public mistakes, Gibson's then-president, Henry Juskowitz, gave the nod in 2010 to release the Firebird X, a homely take on a non-reverse Firebird with robot tuning machines. Dave Grohl of Foo Fighters was known for his use of Explorers, but also his fondness for Firebirds. Jem Archer of Oasis used a non-reverse Firebird, as has Warren Haynes. Bryce Dessner from The National plays a non-reverse 7, and Scott Halliday of Rival Sons plays many original and custom-built Firebirds. Elliot Easton of the Cars played a gold poly mist Firebird 5 with a Bigsby added that spawned a Tiki Bird guitar custom model with two classic humbucking pickups and Steinberg gearless tuners. And PJ Harvey is known to frequent a Firebird 7. Joe Bonamassa has a great story of a fan gifting him an original Firebird 1, which he then worked with Epiphone to recreate the guitar, releasing it in the original Sunburst and in gold. There's also been a recent Slash Firebird from the custom shop and in the Epiphone line. That adds up to six different Firebird-style guitars to choose from in the Gibson, Gibson Custom, and Epiphone lines at current day. I've partnered with Truefire because I've used them for over a decade, and my playing always improves when I put in the time on their lessons. Whether you're a beginner, intermediate, or professional-level player, Truefire has lessons to inspire and advance your playing. As you know, I always promote spending money on lessons before new gear. I really like Truefire, and I think if you give them a shot, you'll like them too. Get 25% off courses using the promo code 5 watt 25 Or like I have for many years, sign up for the All Access Pass to use the entire Truefire catalog. I'm currently enjoying going through Jeff McElane's new Pentatonic Deep Dive course. You can sample anything in the catalog with the All Access Pass and see where the muse takes you. I love their tagline, learn, practice, and play with Truefire. I'd like to thank Truefire for partnering with me and sponsoring this video. I think it's fascinating that these guitars, so unusual in design, produced for such a short time, have such a strong gravitational pull in our minds. I've seen videos with Eric Johnson playing a Firebird. Vintage gear devotee Robin Ford even bought a 2019 model while he was visiting Sweetwater for a clinic. He then went on to play the guitar for the whole night at the final show of that visit. And despite my love for the very modern T-style Strandberg sailing guitars, that really grows out of my love for Telecasters, I have very traditional taste in guitars, and yet, there is something that draws me to a Firebird. I've never played one, never even held one, but really, is there anything cooler looking than a Firebird under the lights? This video would not have been possible without Tony Bacon's excellent book, Flying V Explorer Firebird. There's a link in the description. 
As is often the case, I need to thank the good people at Mike and Mike's Guitar Bar for the use of their excellent gut shots of the vintage Firebirds. They always seem to have just what I need, when I need it. I need to thank the guys at Dave's Guitars for their use of the Firebird pick in the thumbnail. I need to thank Dave Honorato for adding the details that very few seem to know. Of course, I need to thank Perry McManus for stepping in to clean up my wanderings in yet another long history script. And finally, I need to thank my friend and fellow YouTuber, Red Shull, for playing the intro and outro on his Gibson Custom Shop Firebird. That guitar lights up even my guitar envy. I asked at the last minute, and he hit it out of the park. If you enjoyed the video, remember to hit the store for a t-shirt or a hoodie, and check out the Stomp preset pack while you're there. And if you don't need more stuff, think about our club membership, the Friends of 5 Watt. The links are in the description. All your support is appreciated. Thanks for watching. Until next time, thanks for being a part of the 5 Watt world.